Today, my friends, is the first day of the rest of your life, but it is also the first day of a series of programs related to the powers, the latent powers in mankind. We have decided to organize a series of two years program on this subject because it's a subject which, which is extremely broad. There's a lot to talk about, to discuss. We need to cover this well in a, a contemporary, in a modern way. And research has shown that over 50% of the people in the Western world have had uh, extraordinary business. And probably that, uh, you belong to that over 50% of that population because otherwise probably you would not be sitting here in this hall today. So actually those experiences are less extraordinary as we from the sounds refer to. So today is the first day of this series of programs that we are going to uh, organize. Um, in two years, a uh, week's time, there will be a program with Martin Leidemann, also from the United States, The Science, um, a, a very beautiful um, book on the spiritual path. The 9th of November, we have a program on religions, um, religious and mysterious experiences. And then in February, on rituals and healing. In May, working with energies. Um, and uh, next summer, we have an international seminar uh, with, on the science of so uh, more a search on the powers latent in mankind. And I'm also happy to say that in two years' time, Kurt Leland, who will be the speaker today, will come back for a whole seminar on, on uh, this subject. <coughs> that brings me to the introduction of Kurt Leland. Well, you have read, of course, uh, the program, otherwise you would not be here, as I said. But there is a quote of Kurt that I'd like to, uh, to um, read, because it very much uh, clarifies um, how he looks at this uh, search together. It's my belief that the emphasis on the universal brotherhood, the first objectives of Christianity, encourages the development of unity consciousness and the principle of spiritual intuition, the very important aspect for the work of the Theosophical Society, and, that's, uh, and that there is no safer way for our psychic and spiritual abilities to unfold than through constant immersion of unity consciousness in our thoughts, feelings, and actions. Put the floor so I'll be speaking today partially as a clairvoyant because these are abilities that I've developed since I was a young person, not since childhood, but sometime after that. And also as a theosophist, which I became much later, only uh, about 10 years ago. And one of the reasons that I joined the Theosophical Society was I discovered that there is a vast body of wisdom literature that deals specifically with issues of out of body and astral projection experiences, which are two interests of mine, as well as devas and nature spirits, which we'll be talking about today. And I continue to make new discoveries in this literature. It's well worth exploring, even though it is over a century old in many cases. So, <clears throat> Today I want to speak about sacred places, and uh, this first lecture, as you can see, is about how we perceive them. Again, I'll be speaking as a clairvoyant. And I want to um, just give you a little idea of how the program will progress. So I'll stop fairly often to take questions. I'll only take a few questions at each stopping point so that we can get finished in time. And uh, so this morning, how we perceive them. This afternoon, we'll go a little more deeply into the perception, but also the co-creation between human consciousness <coughs> and deva consciousness that can result in a sacred place. And then I will outline for you the steps and a practice 
that I call the Angels of the Four Corners, and I'll explain how I learned this practice, and then we'll actually do it in the context of this um, space, so that you'll have a chance to experience what it's like. And part of that practice is uh, a connection through, you could call it the Great Mother, to unity consciousness, so that it will serve two purposes. One will be an illustration of how to use the angels in a space, like a large space like this hall, or in a home, or in a business setting. I'll explain all of that. And then we'll have the unity consciousness, which will result from our combined efforts in this practice. <laughs> so, of course, to begin any kind of investigation like this, the first step is to come up with a definition. What is a sacred space? And this required a lot of thought because I really wanted to put everything that could be said about sacred spaces into one PowerPoint slide, which is not so easy unless you make the type very, very small. So I consider these to be physical locations. They could be natural or they could be man-made. And in them, we have sensations, such as awe, beauty, reverence, and peace. And as we have these sensations, we go into a much deeper state that is blissful or ecstatic and timeless and spaceless. And we may also have mystical or magical experiences in the context of these spaces. So again, just to outline very quickly, physical, they could be natural or man-made. We have a kind of, I'll call it an entry sensation, the beginning as we walk into it of some kind of opening, then a deepening state, and then some kind of resulting experience, mystical or magical. So I think of sacred spaces as having these three primary functions. They're conduits of energy, which means that if you believe in the idea of a non-physical reality or a subtle reality, there's a flow of energy from that reality into our physical reality. And there's also the possibility of a flow from us back so that there's a mutual exchange between higher beings and us as physical beings. They can also be used as portals of entry, which means consciousness can move back and forth between these other non-physical realities and our physical reality through a sacred space. And they also function as networks of communication, which means a kind of exchange can happen where we're able to make known our thoughts and feelings and needs to higher powers, and they're able to respond to that. And in some cases, they may also have instruction or guidance for us or requests of something they need for us to do. So as conduits of energy, as I mentioned, there's a flow between the physical and the non-physical realms or levels of being. And this can involve, for example, a blessing, which is a typical movement from the non-physical side to the physical side. <laughs> <clears throat> there can be gratitude, which is the movement from our hearts back to the non-physical side. Those are just two of many possible examples. I wanted to demonstrate that the flow is in both directions. As portals of entry, they allow for conscious beings to move between the physical and non-physical realms. And again, I give two examples. The first one is what could be called an apparition. And again, this is the movement from non-physical to physical. So it could be the presence of an angel. You might feel it, you might see it, you might hear it, but there's a sense that the angel is present with you in the physical space, in the sacred space. And then there's also the possible of astral projection, which is something that I've done for 45 years since I was a teenager, where the sacred space becomes an opportunity to go into another realm of being and visit with or, or perceive and 
communicate with higher beings. And then as networks of communication, messages can be transferred back and forth across this boundary between physical and non-physical reality. So again, from physical to non-physical, typically in religions we have worship, we have prayer, we have offering. And these are all moving from us in the physical reality up to or through to some higher being. And then the opposite, the non-physical to the physical movement, involves guidance, protection, and influence. So it's pretty typical, for example, that people in some churches will pray to a saint who would be considered a higher being. And as a result of that prayer, some form of guidance or protection or influence might develop for us here. So then, now that we've talked about uh, what a sacred space is, and we've talked about the functions of sacred spaces, we can also talk about types. So again, speaking as a clairvoyant, I find when I move through a landscape like this center at Narden, there are some PowerPoints present that are already existing. I think of these PowerPoints as places where the illusion of physical reality are hung, so to speak, like nails for hanging a picture. And they don't move. They're always there. They can also be organically developed. And an example of that is an ecosystem, for example, from a virgin forest or an ancient forest. As a result of all of these beings growing together for centuries, there can be a feeling of sacred space that develops. Probably they don't consider it sacred space, but when we enter it, we can feel that for ourselves. And they can also be collaboratively developed um, through the use of sacred objects and through the creation of places of worship. So what I mean by collaborative is, again, a connection from human to non-physical or higher beings working together. And a lot of my presentation, especially this afternoon, <coughs> will be about that collaborative creation. So I want to give some examples. Um, <coughs> some of the sacred spaces that I have slides for, I've not been to, but they're very famous. And some of them are relatively unknown. And this one is an example. So Pumpkin Hollow is a, a summer camp of the Theosophical Society in the United States. And it's in New York, north of New York City, and several hours west of Boston, which is where I live. And this camp was established about 80 years ago by a famous Theosophical clairvoyant who was Dutch, although she was born in uh, Java, and that is Dora Van Gelder. Um, pardon my American pronunciation. This is how I always hear it. So, um, Dora was one of the last clairvoyants trained by Charles W. Ledbetter, who's again a famous clairvoyant in the Theosophical Society. And she lived quite a long <coughs> life, dying in 1999 uh, in her 90s and was very influential in the formation of the Theosophical Society in Australia and also in the United States. So this place, Pumpkin Hollow, I was teaching at um, two weekends ago. And I took my camera around and took some photographs of the different points. So I call this a PowerPoint. And what I want you to notice about it is there's a circular element here. I'll talk more about that in a moment. There's a tree here, and notice how there's a missing part of the tree. The PowerPoint is actually right in that spot. Somehow the tree didn't want to grow into it. <laughs> um, you can also see there are some sacred statues here from different religious traditions. And I'll talk more about this later. The reason I'm using this slide is to demonstrate a PowerPoint that already exists in the landscape. Somebody sensed the existence of that PowerPoint. It may have been Dora herself. And the result was the building up of this special place around it, a quiet place for uh, meditation in a garden. 
So an example of an ecosystem, um, this is from Sequoia National Park in California, the far west of the United States. Um, this is not my own picture, but this is a place I have visited. There's another theosophical summer camp called Far Horizons that's in this area. And we have here trees that are anywhere between 1,500 years and 2,500 years or more in age. So this is an example of a sacred space that is built up organically as an ecosystem. And when you walk among these trees, you can't help but feel awe and reverence. They really feel like great spiritual beings surrounding you. Um, this is what I consider to be a sacred object. Um, it's a kind of quartz crystal. It appears to be fairly rare. Um, I'll tell a story about it, because this is something that I own. Um, it's a kind of smoky quartz. Most smoky quartz is formed by taking a clear crystal that's come out of the ground clear, and then it's irradiated. And in the irradiation process, it develops the darkness. Personally, I don't like to work with crystals like that because I feel that they've been damaged somehow in the irradiation process. This is a crystal that formed in the area of some radiation source. And so the development of the smokiness is completely natural. And it seems to be called a Morion crystal, but you won't find much information if you look it up um, on the internet. Um, personally, I found it very powerful in healing work, and I'll talk more about that this afternoon. So um, here's the famous Stonehenge, uh, used as a place of worship, which I think would be considered a collaborative development. Probably an already existing PowerPoint and then the people who came in were amplifying in various ways by bringing in these enormous stones. A place I would like to visit, but I haven't had a chance. <clears throat> so, in order to talk about uh, sacred spaces as a general subject, we have to understand that they all have one thing in common, and that's the presence of non-physical beings which in theosophy are called devas, borrowing a Sanskrit word that means shining ones. And the idea is that these are very like the angels of the Christian tradition. Also, Muslim and, and Judaism have such shining beings. So in the theosophical teachings, these devas are arranged in an evolutionary hierarchy that runs parallel to our human development. They start with elementals, which are the most basic type. An elemental being, for example, is a being of fire, or earth, or air, or water. We know about gnomes, for example, um, as beings of earth. So those are on the lower end of the scale. <clears throat> it moves through to fairies. And when I use this word in this context, I don't mean cute little beings this high. It's something more like the way that fairies are talked about in Irish mythology and folklore, where they are the beautiful ones, the tall, strong, heroic ones, who have a special magical realm that humans sometimes find their way into and get lost. And uh, so those are called the she in Irish culture. And then it goes on to the higher angels and to the archangels who are the ones that manage all of creation under the divine. So going more deeply into this idea of devas, um, I'd like to define what they are both in theosophical literature, but also in my own personal experience of living and working with them. <laughs> They're the thoughts of God manifested as conscious beings. And their purpose is to embody and enforce the laws of the universe, which include not only physical and scientific laws, for example, gravity, thermodynamics, but also the spiritual and moral laws that govern the human universe and the universe of consciousness in general, which we usually call karma. I won't talk about this today, but one of the ideas you see referred to in theosophical literature is the lords of karma 
and the lords of Kama are part of this uh, nature spirit deva hierarchy. They're at the upper end. So continuing along the idea of what devas are, I consider them to be the force of synthesis. Their function is to bring things together and to create wholes. And especially, they allow us to create and maintain links between physical and non-physical reality. So we naturally have some of these links. We dream every night, and in the theosophical teachings that means we go in our, our astral body to the astral plane, have experiences there, and return. So we have an astral body. Theori theoretically, we're always in connection with this astral plane, but our conscious awareness usually tunes it out. So physical reality itself is supported energetically by a flow of energy from the topmost levels of being, the divine, through the different planes, through the astral plane to the physical plane. And devas are responsible for that energy flow. So they unite every conscious being and level of existence into ever larger holes. And you can think about this in terms of ecosystems, how the soil, the bacteria, the plants, and the animals all come together to create a whole. And devas encourage that and hold it. So for example, um, if some of you are familiar with the teachings of the Finnhorn community in Scotland, um, there are communications from what are called landscape devas. And these are high devas that encompass all of these different systems that create a larger ecosystem. But they also involve the um, bringing together of individual humans into a larger collective humanity, a brotherhood of humanity, as planetary stewards. So in the context of my talk, period periodically, I'll be showing some ways in which theosophical practitioners who are artists like to illustrate the devas. And this is a relatively unknown name compared to, for example, Jeffrey Hodson, who's pretty famous, Janet Melanie Elsa Mills, who wrote under the name H.K. Chaloner. Um, this is an example of one of her paintings of what she called a solar deva. And you can find this in a book called either Watchers of the Seven Spheres or Regents of the Seven Spheres. I'll have um, six or seven of her illustrations today. So then finally wrapping up this definition of sacred places, there's the question of what are the components of sacred places. First, there's the point of power, which I've already referred to. And this point of power has the unique ability or sense or function of feeling like the center of the universe. And it feels that this universe radiates out from it. I'll explain more about what I mean by that later. There's usually a spiritual guardian of such a point of power, a deva or an angel. And there are usually boundaries. The uh, sphere of influence of the point of power is limited in some way. It could be uh, a, a few meters, it could be a few kilometers, depending on the size of the being. <clears throat> but usually there's some form of sacred geometry that helps to pool the influence of this reservoir, of this power into a reservoir. And that's what sacred geometry is doing. And then there may be means of amplifying the power and our sensitivity to it. For example, uh, the use in churches and in, in ceremonial of light, color, sound, and incense. Primarily, those are things that help to enhance our own participation in the sacred space and connection to the beings there. And often in ones that have been collaboratively built up, some uh, part of this will be a map of the universe that can include stars, the zodiac, the planets, the levels of being like a ladder or uh, levels of heaven and so on. And there's often also 
uh, a map of the spiritual journey of the human soul, for example, a labyrinth. Now, in the next few slides, I'll be fairly quickly going through some examples of each of these. And then finally, there will often be a human guardian and spokesperson, a priest or shaman, who acts as an intermediary between the higher realms and beings and, and our human consciousness. So uh, here is probably an unfamiliar sacred place uh, in the southwest of the United States, a place that I visited called Chimney Rock. You can see why it's called Chimney Rock. It looks like chimney, obviously. Um, you can see this for, along the highway for many, many kilometers, and uh, it's quite impressive. And you can imagine that the Native American peoples in, in the area would have seen it and been attracted to it and would want to have investigated it and seen what sort of power could be found there. And it's a fairly obvious idea of a point of power as the center of the universe. And as it happens, on the top of Chimney Rock, you have these two pillars of a sort. And it really was seen by the Native Americans as a point of power. The moon in that position there is enacting something called a lunar standstill. It's a very complicated phenomenon. I won't try to explain it. But it happens only every 18 and a half years. So somehow the Native Americans discovered that every 18 and a half years they wanted to be in this location so that they could see the moon rise between these two rocks, which it didn't at any other time in those 18.6 years. And they built a sacred ceremonial kiva. Here's a reservoir, you could say, or it would have had a roof over it, but it's typical of sacred geometry to use circles for this purpose. And uh, in one of the languages of the Native Americans, this is called kiva, 11th century. So uh, at least 1,000 years old. Now, this next slide is a corresponding uh, location in Israel. It's uh, a monastery from the 5th century. And what you can see about it is it's built up on a higher elevation. Uh, you can see that it has a center of power here. I haven't been there, so I don't know what in the landscape, uh, energetically or in terms of a, a visible <coughs> outcropping of rock or what have you, where a spring would have been there to cause that uh, special place to be built. But again, we have the desert, not the kind of place you would expect people to come and live if they were attracted there, because it was a sacred space to them. And now here we have something from Narden, um, <coughs> um, a spiritual guardian. It's a statue of the Buddha that I have heard is very old and came from northern Thailand. And uh, often, even though it's a statue made of metal, a deva will come and occupy that statue so that you can have the feeling of being in a sacred space when you're near. The other deva uh, possibility, this statue here, it's an image of Tara from the uh, Mahayana Buddhist tradition. The statue is very new, only a few years old, and no deva has come into it yet. So um, if you're interested in exploring some of the um, ideas I'm talking about today, one of the best ways to help you develop your inner senses is to make a comparison between something that you feel and something that should be the same but is different in some way. So. If I were leading a tour, for example, through the grounds, I would say, walk up to this Buddha and notice the feeling of being embraced by a sacred space, and then go to the other one and notice that it doesn't have that feeling. And then you learn from making comparisons like this. Uh, so this is the Ring of Rodgar and Orkney, Scotland. Um, 
I use this image as a representation of boundaries and sacred geometry. So once again, it's a circle, something like Stonehenge. Um, the outside of the circle creates the boundaries. The stones represent both uh, protection for the center of the space, but also a pool for the spiritual energy to build up inside. I've not been to this place. Those of you who have uh, seen the brochure for this uh, series of talks today will recognize that I took many of the images. It was interesting because uh, the designer of the brochure pulled these off the internet in what I assumed to be a somewhat random way. And yet, they managed to illustrate all of the different points that I wanted to make about sacred spaces. Uh, another one that was on the brochure and also very famous representing sacred geometry, and that's the Great Pyramid. I'm not going to speak about the, the Sphinx, but obviously this connection to the sunset demonstrates some kind of astronomical alignment that's going on there. And that's another <coughs> typical feature of sacred spaces. Uh, Hagia Sophia in Istanbul from the 6th century. Here's an example of what sacred geometry looks like from inside. Again, lots of circles and pillars and wings and uh, not exactly a cross formation, but uh, some, some kind of perhaps east-west orientation. I haven't looked deeply into it. And here's an example of what I mean by amplification of power in a modern example, uh, the Sagrada Familia uh, Church by Gaudi in Barcelona. Um, really, from the picture, again, I haven't been here, but from the picture, it looks like you are just overwhelmed in an aura of light when the sun is shining through these stained glass windows. And that, I can well imagine, combined with sacred music, would create an altered state of consciousness. So this is the uh, Dendera Zodiac from Egypt. <coughs> it's considered to be the oldest map of the stars or of the universe that is known as such. There are probably older ones, but it's not easy to recognize them and know how they connect to the stars as we see them now. From the temple of Hathor, although it's now in Paris. And this is uh, the roof of one of the chapels, I suppose, in the <laughs> temple of Hathor. And as you can see, uh, these beings that are holding up the center, those are representing uh, the gods that hold up the sky, and then within that are the different signs of the zodiac as far as they were perceived by the ancient Egyptians. It's fairly typical to have this kind of thing in sacred spaces, and even in many public ones. For example, the Boston Public Library, which is a sacred space dedicated to knowledge, has a zodiac in the floor in the entrance as you come inside. And then there's the famous labyrinth of Chartres Cathedral from the 13th century, representing a map of the spiritual journey, the movement deeply, deeply, deeply within, you know, until you get to the center, through all of the different uh, pathways that we have to take to have that experience, and then the unwinding return back to our lives and physical reality and ordinary waking consciousness bringing the fruits of what we've learned from that inner journey. Uh, this was not an example that was given on the brochure. Um, what was given on the brochure was identified as a shaman. And um, there's an interesting feature of Google where you can upload an image to Google and it will tell you what it really is which is a good idea when you're trying to be authentic for a presentation like this. What I discovered was that image was a pilgrim in Varanasi and not a shaman in South America, which was, uh, so I had to find another illustration for the uh, human guardians and spokespersons. And these are Shinto priests from Japan in the early 20th century. So, questions. Uh, we'll take a little pause for a couple questions. This is a ceremonial deva illustrated by uh, Janet Melanie Samuels. Um, the idea is that there is a church in the center here. Some kind of service is going on there. And the angel is 
holding the space and distributing the radiation, the vibrations of that ceremony throughout the village. So, if anyone wants to ask a question, there's a microphone, so please wait for the microphone to come to you. And yes, there's a question in the back. <coughs> understood that all, all sacred places are, are built on ley lines as power places. Um, yeah, but I missed that in, in, in your presentation. Okay, the reason for that is I only speak about what I know from my own clairvoyant experience. And when I find a PowerPoint, I can identify it as a part of the landscape, but I'm not always personally aware of the connection it may have to other common points. I would have to be in a sacred space for a long time to feel that. Also, I haven't uh, done any training in dowsing using the sticks, which is one of the ways to find those spaces. So um, it's good that you bring it up because this is a part of the common knowledge about sacred spaces. But um, my not speaking about it is a result of a lack of training, not a lack of belief or understanding. About such things. Another question? Here? <coughs> a lot of these spaces seem to be old and well established. Are there also uh, possibilities of these spaces being temporary? Um, not so much, I think, for the PowerPoints that are a permanent part of the landscape. The features that gather the energy can come and go. But we also have examples uh, in Europe of stony uh, temples that then developed over the years and eventually became a cathedral. And you could say each of those stages was a temporary manifestation. Um, but I think what you mean is, uh, let's call it a pop sacred space. <laughs> um, I think what you'll learn this afternoon is that we can create them as an altar, for example. And that the longer we have the altar in place and the more we feed it with our energy and dialogue with it, the stronger the link becomes between physical reality and non-physical reality. And a deva may come and hold that link. I was thinking of places that uh, uh, could be dramatically changed, like from lava flow or, or oh. something geological happening to change it. Okay, yeah, that's a good thing. Um, the best example that I know of personally is I went camping with a friend in one of the southern states um, in the area of a big reservoir of water. And in order to build the reservoir, all the trees were cut down, and then they were replanted. And those trees were about 30 years old um, from the time of the, of the dam being produced. And I could find no PowerPoints anywhere in that lab. Now, what typically happens with a tree is it goes from having a tree spirit inside of it uh, to maturity when a larger deva comes in because the tree is now connected to an ecosystem. So maybe in 20 years, mm -hmm. something like that will develop. I think it takes a long time. Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, less so in a lava flow, because I assume that uh, <coughs> there may be energetic points that are per a permanent part of the landscape. And it's a question as to whether nothing will grow there or everything will grow there to let you know that it's a special place. <coughs> Another question? Here. <coughs> How about, uh, uh, for example, the Notre Dame? It was a famous uh, building that a lot of people went for prayer, so very active in energy. And now it's burned down. How will that affect the universe? And I think of a disaster like that in the same way I think of many natural disasters. 
and that is um, we're losing the links between physical reality and non-physical reality through ecosystems being destroyed and through sacred spaces being lost and the understanding of how to connect with them. And I think the devas who protect such spaces sometimes allow these natural disasters to occur to remind us humans to come together and recreate them and reestablish the links. That's something I'll talk more about this afternoon. So I think uh, I'll go on now with my talk and there'll be other opportunities for questions. <coughs> so now we get into the subject of how we perceive sacred spaces. And uh, my experience teaching classes in psychic and spiritual development is that our inner senses are able to pick up information, non-physical information, in three different ways. And each of us has a temperament based on the way that is right for us, that is easy for us. So we can perceive it as energy, which means vibration, inner senses, the experience of truth. And these are things that people simply know when they have this sensitivity to energy. It can also come in the form of information. Um, this has more to do with matter, even non-physical matter, things like bodies, things like planes, and also uh, what we perceive when we're in an altered state of consciousness and how we represent that or translate that using imagery. So the energy people don't use imagery and they don't trust it often. They feel that words and images somehow lessen the truth or authenticity of their experience. Whereas those who are related to information are much more detailed and perceive a lot of, um, of colors and interactions, energetic flows, but they'll see them as objects or uh, places. And then the third type is consciousness. And those who are involved with that are able to perceive any kind of intelligent being that we're able to interact or communicate with. And then I list some examples, devas, angels, nature spirits, elementals, and thought <coughs> forms. Probably many of you are familiar with the theosophical idea of thought forms. Um, what is maybe less familiar is that a thought form is a messenger being. So even though it's taught as a visual thing, um, for example, a heart with wings that you send as love to someone else, there's a being carrying that message. Ourselves, um, the living and the dead, and evolved humans, the superhuman masters and adepts, are the beings that are accessible through this experience of consciousness. So again, each of us is keen or allied with one of these ways of perceiving non-physical uh, experience. And that results in our psychic temperaments. So with respect to sacred places, if we're on the energy perspective or spectrum, we'll perceive sacred spaces in, true, in terms of truth. There'll be a, a sense of the energy of the, of the place. I'll call that clairsentience, which means clear sensing. And these types tend to be mystics. Mystics are uh, often not so interested in space and time. They want to have higher experience Bodies and planes are not of interest to them. All they want is, is God consciousness and higher levels of connection to that. <laughs> the types who are keyed to information are all constantly dealing with images, and these are clairvoyance, and they tend to be occultists in the theosophical community. <coughs> so there's often an argument about whether theosophy is mysticism or occultism. <coughs> And really, it's both, depending on whether you're of the energy type or whether you're of the information type. Personally, I'm of the information type, which is why I call myself a clairvoyant. And then the third type, the consciousness type, is always related to beings and develops clairaudience, which is the ability to hear and communicate with these beings. And they tend to be mediums. And, um, in the Theosophical Society, there's often a certain discomfort around the idea of mediumship. I think it's a valid way of perceiving reality. 
is just not um, the same way as, as mystics and clairvoyants perceive it. Looks like I might need to get a new battery or something. Oh, here we go. Got it. Okay, so there are developmental stages um, of each of these where you start with your own type, but then gradually you're able to add in a, another one and possibly even master all three. And depending on which level you're operating from, that will be the level of truthfulness or authenticity or confirmation to reality of anything that you perceive um, physically. So you can see um, the places of connection between two and then the center where all three are present. And I find that whatever is your first tends to be always there, but it's modified by the others. So um, for me, uh, out of body experiences, dreaming, claims, those were the first thing that developed for me. Then later, the ability to communicate with other consciousness, and then finally the, the mystical energy part. <clears throat> and I think of our founder, Madame Blavatsky, as being someone who had uh, that place in the center in the previous slide, where mysticism, occultism, and a kind of mediumship all correlated with each other. Think of this in terms of having a perception of, of the truth, being fluent in, in imagery, perceiving it and using it as analogies for other people, but also connections to beings, such as the Theosophical Masters. And then, interestingly enough, <clears throat> the other two major clairvoyants of this early period, Annie Besson and C.W. Redbeater, each had only two, and when they worked together, um, they ended up counterbalancing each other in the area that they were less experienced in. So Annie Besson was a mystic. She was fascinated by the idea of truth, but she also had a connection to the masters that was clairaudient. And when she was giving her lectures throughout the world, she was constantly listening and feeling for the right word that the masters wanted her to say. Ledbeater, on the other hand, was a clairvoyant and medium. He also had that direct uh, connection through communication to the masters, but his specialty was images. The thing we need to know about this is the connection to images of beings is in a sense less real than the mystical connection to the truth. So ultimately, we always need to add that in if we're developing ourselves spiritually. The mystics know this and uh, they think of themselves as being superior because of it. And you'll get discussions where they'll say, none of that matters. You know, the beings don't matter. The imagery doesn't matter. Only the truth, only God consciousness. But it's just one way. And then we have Jeffrey Hodson, another somewhat later theosophical clairvoyant who specialized in devas and nature spirits. Um, he was also, like Lev Peter, uh, clairvoyant and a medium. Um, his mediumistic work is not so well known, but um, if you look at the bottom of the slide, uh, those five books were all full of messages that he got from angels. And uh, the upper books are the ones that he wrote where he was describing the imagery and the visuals of nature spirits and devas. And in particular, I'd like to highlight this book called The Kingdom of the Gods, which probably is in the bookstore here. So Hudson worked with an artist, and in working with the artist, he communicated what he saw, and then the artist tried to represent it, and then he um, would correct the artist if there were problems. And so there are a number of illustrations from that book that I'll use as examples. Now remember, what we're talking about is how we perceive sacred spaces, including devas. So what I want to demonstrate is how the perception of deva will be different depending on which type you are. So if you're an energy type, the important thing is the atmosphere of the deva when you're in its presence. There may be a feeling of the quality of the energy or the mood that's present in the space. 
uh, you may also get a sense of the purpose of the devil and the function that the devil performs. And there's a feeling of a radiation of energy out from that, uh, a sense of power and a sense of the influence of that energy. However, what's missing is there won't be any appearance, there won't be any imagery, and there may not be a sense of a, of a relatable presence or personality, a being that you could communicate with. So this is Jeffrey Hodson's illustration of an, what he called an angel of Java, and this is the famous uh, Buddhist temple of Borobudur. Oops, sorry. You can see the uh, shape of the dome of that temple here. And what's important to understand is you have this radiation of a sort of being in the center, but there's no face, no features, no relatability, no imagery, only this powerful radiation of force in all directions. So that's how a is perceived by someone who specializes in energy. The information type, which is my type, has a somewhat different approach. The important thing and the focus will be on the appearance of it, using imagery, uh, the shape of it, the color of it, also the size, such as the height or the range. But there won't be a sense of its purpose or its function, because that comes with uh, the truth side of things, the energy side. And there may be no sense of it as a presence or a personality. So you could say that this uh, information type is ideally suited to what we call clairvoyant investigation, meaning the information that you gather is quote unquote scientific, the height, the range of the uh, energy projection of the deva. And here's an example from Jeffrey Hudson of how a deva is perceived through information. Um, a kundalini, Devi, a female deva. What you can see about this one is there's an enormous amount of information encoded in the picture. The chakras of the deva are outlined through here. You've got a flow, outflow of energy that's something like wings. You have a connection that Hudson called the connection to heaven or the cosmos here, and a connection to earth here through a representation of the backbone of a meditating person. So if you uh, think about the earlier one, there's a lot more detail in this one, and it's relatable physical detail. And then the consciousness types have even yet another experience of devas. Primarily of a presence of a personality, a feeling of peace and uplift, joy and love in the presence of this personality. Often there's a feeling that the personality is embracing you. Uh, relationship is the key thing, and this can really uh, result in a feeling of some kind of uh, mental, spiritual contact with the being. Um, there can be a, spirit, a feeling of being embraced by or uh, being unified with that being, and there can be an exchange of um, some kind of feeling that conveys a message. And again, the appearance and the imagery will not be strong. Um, the sense of purpose or function is uh, also potentially not very strong. Um, the image that I'm going to use for this is actually a much stronger one than you would imagine here. Um, it's the world mother from the kingdom of the gods. But the important thing about it is the image is sort of dissolving. It's not the most important thing. But there is a sense of radiation, but it's the personality of the, the mother image that's coming through this one. And you can feel directly just by looking at it, there's a heart connection to it, unlike the Kundalini Devi, which feels somewhat active but cold. So again, uh, questions. Here's a music deva, uh, as illustrated by Janet Gandhi of Sun Hills. Um, this one has in, uh, quite active imagery, so I would say she was probably of the imagistic type, the information type. Questions?
um, sometimes I'm in a special place and I notice that um, there's easy communication going on and then other times there's no communication at all. That's one question. And what's the connection between the devas and other universes? Okay, so with the first question, our inner senses are active or not active? And it's not necessarily um, a matter of the beings withdrawing themselves from us, although I think sometimes they can hide themselves. But if they communicate with you under some circumstances, I would say it's probably not the case. You know, we have upsets. There are many things that happen in our ordinary waking consciousness that can uh, make it difficult to be uh, connected through our inner senses, or sometimes possibly even unsafe to connect through our inner senses. And all we can really do is notice, and then when the conditions are right, simply open and experience that. I never advise the possibility of forcing anything under those circumstances when there's no communication. But I have a suspicion, probably there is a message when you're in those spaces that, that says don't force anything, don't try anything. And so a message is coming through, it's just not a, an elaborate message. And in that case, there may even be another message which is just be at peace, be at rest, don't be active, be embraced, be healed. The second question, uh, again, I can't really uh, speak from personal experience about the connections between devas and other universes, but I can experience, talk about from my own experience is the different planes of being that are talked about in theosophical literature. Some of them are so far beyond our ordinary experience in terms of space and time, that it can feel like being on another planet. And in fact, the word that is uh, used in Sanskrit for these places, in some of the older theosophical literature, is loka. And it's often translated as planet or plane. And I think in some of that literature, when Lepeter, for example, gives very detailed descriptions of the inhabitants of Mars, you know, science would say there are no such inhabitants. Maybe not on the physical plane, maybe on some higher plane connected with the planet. But my personal feeling is that he was on a different plane and he thought of it as a planet. Remember, he was not um, connected so well to the energy and the truth. And therefore, some kind, sometimes there are mis uh, misperceptions. So, sorry I can't answer that about Universes. There's a lot of speculation and a lot of theory, and um, I always find it interesting, but unless it's a part of my experience, it's not something I like to pass on, because uh, what I've personally validated, I can speak for with confidence. So, another question. Let's go on then. Ah, oh, that's the end. <laughs> so, I'm going to go back to something about um, the three types, energy, information, and consciousness. And I want to talk about the experience that people have in groups when they're with others who may have these temperaments or inner sensibilities. Because there's a friction that develops. Everybody thinks they are normal. And judge other people on that basis. And in this particular case, I think it creates a certain amount of stress. <clears throat> so what typically happens, as I already mentioned, is the mystics are saying, none of this is important. But if you come into a group as uh, a clairvoyant, the idea of auras and subtle bodies and planes, that's who you are. That's where you start. And to be told it's not important is not very friendly. And as a result, <clears throat> the Theosophical Society has historically been a very comfortable place for mystics and a only moderately comfortable place for clairvoyants. Um, also connected with this, 
there was a controversy in the early history of the Theosophical Society where Adam Blavatsky was trying to make a uh, differentiation between spiritualism and theosophy. And in that early, uh, her early writings, she spoke out quite strongly against mediumship. And the result is that people who are on the consciousness temperament side definitely do not feel welcomed in, in the Theosophical Society. This is something I'm trying to change by talking about this subject because if the Theosophical Society is working toward human brotherhood, it can't exclude one third of the people just because they talk to dead people, right? <laughs> in fact, I would think they would want to bring these people in and learn from them. Now, I've said this, but it's also important to note the limitations of these types. So for example, a clairvoyant who dies in, uh, temporarily and has a near-death experience might go into the afterlife and will see a city. And the city has roads, and the roads are paved with gold. And he comes back and says, there's a real city. There are real roads. And they're paved with real gold. And takes everything literally. Now, if this person is connected to the energy side, also in addition to clairvoyance, there might be a recognition of the, the truth behind that, which is there's a place where people are gathered that looks or feels like a city. There's a path, or many paths, that go through that city, representing the paths of people in the afterlife. And there's one path that's right for you, and it lights up and looks like gold because it's so valuable for you. So obviously, uh, People who are operating from the clairvoyant side of things have to learn how to be sensitive in this way. And then with the, the consciousness individuals, <clears throat> their challenge is they love the feeling of relationship. And they almost don't care what they're relating to. And so they could be relating to uh, a being who has passed on, or a master, <coughs> a higher superhuman uh, being or an angel and they may not know the difference will be interested in knowing the difference and what often happens is they'll feel in the presence of this being that they are loved more than they've ever been loved by anyone in their life so when they uh, have that feeling they say well my grandmother who has died is the only one who loved me so much therefore this being must be my grandmother and in a sense, the difficulty in the early Theosophical Society between uh, Theosophists and Spiritualists uh, was the Spiritualist said, it's always my grandmother. And, and Madame Blavatsky said, it could be other things. And they weren't so interested in hearing it. So in a way, everybody, each type, has a kind of intolerance that it has to overcome in order to relate to the others. I've learned this from my classes that I teach in Boston. I have small groups that I work with teaching practices for psychic and spiritual development, something like what we'll work with this afternoon. And in those classes, I often had trouble with two different kinds of students, the ones who were the uh, consciousness types and the energy types. The energy types would say something like, so excuse me, this will sound very vague, okay? Uh, you don't have to get any clear idea of what I'm saying from these words. There was an opening, and then there was a lifting, and then there was a feeling of expansion, and then there was a multi-dimensional movement through many, many different spaces. Okay, you get the idea. This is the way that mystics often describe their experiences. They're very real inwardly. And it's very difficult to put them into words. And they don't want to be more accurate because somehow if you force it into space and time, it's no longer real and true. So you have to be patient with the mystics if that's not your time. If you're another mystic, you'll be nodding your head and saying, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so um, in a similar way, I had a particular student who was of the consciousness type and who had done some training 
in the spiritualist church. <clears throat> so his interest was relationships and beings. And he would come to me and tell me about his dream experiences. And he often met a guide. And the guide was the most beautiful woman imaginable and radiated the most powerful love that he had ever experienced. And he felt tremendously guilty because he was married. <laughs> <laughs> and he often wondered if this was his soulmate, or twin flame, as they're sometimes called. And so when he would see her in this uh, physical uh, state of consciousness, he would sometimes say, if you're real, please give me your phone number so I can meet you. Um, and I would say to him, no, this is a guy, you know, a non-physical being. And if you would like to learn something, let her take you and show you something. But he was always only interested in being held, and sometimes in sexuality. And the result of that was, many lost opportunities to go out and explore the higher planes. So again, each one has a strength, each one has a limitation, and I think it's important to learn how to be tolerant with all. I lost this particular student because I pushed him too hard to go beyond that limitation, and that's actually how I learned that there are these different types. So questions? Okay, wait till the microphone comes. Where is it? Thank you. Can you explain more uh, about f uh, male and female uh, in the non-physical world? Yes. Yeah. So, in my experience in uh, astral projection, and especially in contact with devas, I often will experience what seems like a male figure or what seems like a female figure. And there isn't really gender in this sense in non-physical reality. I'm receiving an energy and I'm trying to understand it. And I choose an image that somehow corresponds to that energy. I call this translation. I'm translating from the energy to the imagery. And when I do this, it often happens that if the being is very active and forceful, I'll perceive it as a male. And if it is creating space and embracing and supporting, then it's female. Now, uh, the academic gender theorists would probably have a hard time with my explaining this because it seems sexist. The problem is I the translations are made in that way for me and somehow useful. So um, it can happen that if you encounter somebody who's passed on, they will still have the gender of who they were when they were alive. But the longer they're in the afterlife, the less that's true until they incarnate again. Someone else here? Why is it so difficult for all the three types to work together? Is that the ego? That's no, one the knows. no one knows that there are these three types. I think uh -huh. that's the problem. Again, everyone so thinks... So there, there is a hold on people to discuss this yes. together. The thing about um, universal brotherhood is we should be open, of course, to all types. But what is theosophy is the question in the Theosophical Society? What should we teach? Should we teach the mystical approach? Should we teach the occultist approach? Um, there's no idea of wanting to teach the, the mediumistic approach. That is completely withdrawn. And it's understandable that an organization would want to um, find its way through what it has to teach that's different from any other organization. I'd like to see the Theosophical Society be different by welcoming all of these three types and supporting them. And in fact, the literature is very strong in all three. It just happens that, um, well, there's a, a tradition in some um, theosophical societies to do everything they can to avoid calling Madame Blavatsky a medium. 
as one example. It's a word that describes a function that you performed. And even though the word itself has all kinds of sub meanings, the function is the important thing. Um, so introducing the idea of noticing what your type is, and that when you hear someone speaking in a different way, asking yourself the question, might they be of a different type? That's the beginning, I think, of creating more dialogue. Otherwise, all the mystics are getting together and saying, it's about no self. You know, that's one current track along uh, mystical lines. Or it's, um, what do they call it? Um, well, something like Advaita Vedanta, uh, taught by someone like Adyashanti. You know, he's a mystical type, so no imagery, you know, or Islam doesn't like imagery. Uh, there are many, many ways that you can use this to understand the world situation and religions and personal spiritual practice. So I hope that helps. So, I always think if you work together, you can uh, be able to grow a lot more. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, I think One of the reasons... The end is the the old searching for the higher truth. Yes. So that's how you get there. One of the reasons that I travel and teach in the Theosophical Society is to try to make people aware of this distinction and invite people to reconsider it. And part of the reason I do it is when I joined in 2008, I was told to put these things away and not think about them and not talk about them. And yet, everywhere I go where I do talk about them, people come up to me and afterwards and say, finally, someone thinking about this and making it okay again. So we live, we learn, we grow as people and also as organizations. Yes. Well, I'm speaking from my own experience. Maybe you have that as well. Um, you're moving from one uh, period of being maybe more conscious to another period of maybe being more clairvoyant to another period of maybe being more mystic. It sort of, it interacts and it's moving. It's not uh, uh, um, something that, that sticks. It's changing all the time. I think that's ideal because um, as I mentioned, the, the more evolved uh, psychics and spiritual teachings have all three. There's usually one that colors everything, and that's the one that you started with. Um, so that's good. I call that flexibility of consciousness. <laughs> yeah, and it's the opposite of habit and routine and rigidity and dogma. Someone else? How do I know that my experiences are not just fantasy or wishful thinking? So, if you're asking the question, they're real. If you're telling everyone that they're real, they may not be. Now, it sounds like I'm, I'm teasing you or playing a joke. But if you're telling other people, you're trying to convince yourself. And if, if you're trying to convince yourself, probably there's some uh, message from your soul saying, no, not that, not that. Having a humble approach to things and simply holding the experience, that's the best way. And you may learn eventually what it means. You may find a book that explains it or someone who has a similar experience. We don't have to decide whether it's real or not real. Unless we decide that we're somehow going to bring it into the outer world. Um, what I mean by that is to take action on it. So if we have beings in a dream or voices that are telling us, uh, you must save the world from nuclear destruction, you know, 
that can be a very strong, intense experience. And the way we bring it into action will determine whether it's real or not. Someone who uses that as a motivation to become a political activist, there it's real. <coughs> Someone who goes to Hiroshima or Nagasaki and climbs on the highest building and preaches to everyone about how it has to end, that's problematic. So, um, I know people who've done things like this. <laughs> um, any kind of ego inflation that is connected with it, that also makes experience doubtful. But I think if it's intense, it's real. It may not be real in the way that you understand it, so we always need to be uh, willing to change our understanding. But you can't say that any internal experience is unreal if it was real to you in terms of intensity. That's my feeling. And often, um, I have what I call a provisional <coughs> belief. So, if I have an experience I don't understand, but I've read something about it, I provisionally believe it's possible, that it's true. And then I see if that helps. And if I have a later experience that explains it, that's good. But if I'm always just asking myself the question, is this real, is this unreal, I don't move beyond it. And sometimes you need to move beyond the experience itself for you to understand it. So, someone else? Here? <clears throat> Uh, I have quite a different question that came up uh, when I heard this all. Then I, when we came in, we looked at each other, when we come in and see each other, but we are all, all of a certain age, between some, some ages. Huh? Um, they also speak of the indigo children, the crystalline children, they are coming in, who have different uh, possibilities already, but they don't know. Um, in, case of this, with all the consciousness and the energy, these children have perhaps latent in their easier to connect to that, but they have to have guidance. So um, many uh, teachers are going for a burnout. Many children don't know what there is. Is perhaps a US clairvoyant or energy, can you give us a hint how we in our age um, and connecting to those children and your ADE, ADHD, how we can help. If there is something that is already coming, I don't know exactly how to explain it. Yes, I understand it. Speaking realistically, I would say that the parents uh, are too busy to know, you know, just trying to have a job and raise the children to provide that kind of support. But the grandparents, they have the time and the energy, and it's, in a sense, their function, and it creates a special relationship. Uh, my grandfather was that for me. He helped me uh, begin a process of, of learning about being clairvoyant. <clears throat> I wanted to answer the generational question there. Um, and, you know, I think one reason why people are of a certain age here in this room is earlier, it's much more difficult to find the time and the energy and the focus, the concentration to do spiritual work. Uh, our society isn't set up so comfortably for that. But as we uh, become more mature, our minds quiet down or we get more time and, and focus and energy, then we can consider these things. And that means that uh, it's too late for the generation of our own children, but it's not too late for their children. For us to have. Going into schools, it can't really happen unless it's a Waldorf school, because there are always conservative elements who will say, this is too much, um, it's not what we believe, it's not real, it's um, superstition, and things like that. So in terms of social change, I can't really do better than that to answer your question. In Dutch? Waldorf school means free school. I just needed to translate. Oh, yeah, thank you. That's a different uh, Okay, <laughs> good. It's also living by example. Yes, living by, by example. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and then of course you draw to yourself people who are needing to learn something or on, on a similar wavelength. We have just a few minutes until noon and it's lunch time, so I'm happy to keep answering questions or uh, if you'd like to end now and take a break, that's also possible. Okay, let's take this question here. Have you written anything on this uh, special subject? The, the three different three types. kinds? I haven't published a book since I uh, began discovering this. So it's not, nothing is published now. But certainly, um, I'm actually working on a book on nature spirits and devas. And a, a presentation like this <coughs> is actually the process that I go through to decide what the chapters will be about. And, so, but I can't say how long it will take me to write the book and, and offer this information. Okay, thank you. And another one here. <coughs> thank you. I just wanted to contribute to what oh, yes. the other lady was saying, that I noticed that um, I work with adult people and with young people, children, and I noticed that for all of them, the Let's say the vibration, to get to a higher vibration is much more easier now than it was two years ago or five years ago. Mm -hmm. And even in the last half year, there are more portals, more wide open, so there's more communication, there's more connection to the field of unity, and therefore it's easier to communicate. So I notice parents becoming aware and communicating with their children in a different way in the last few years. So, for me, that's causing some optimism if you set that next to the conflict in the world that is avoiding everything that has to do with consciousness. So, I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Yes, and thank you for bringing that into the room. And think about the, the great favor that the extreme conservatives have done for us in pushing us in that direction. Because otherwise, human inertia tends not to let these things go. So, um, there was another question here. Yes. Um, yes, I was um, asking myself, um, how do you think about the idea the ayahuasca shamanism is using smell and taste in order to have better information? Yeah, and also groups and being in the jungle, there, there are many things that bring this uh, kind of power together uh, to create a kind of temporary pop-up sacred space, I guess you could say. Um, so I attended a seminar uh, in afternoon at Harvard University, which is near where I live, about the globalization of the idea of ayahuasca ceremony. And some people who are uh, involved in religious studies think that this is the new religious movement that has come. And it's, in, in a sense, a result of scientific materialism because we're so trained to think with the mind that many people are locked in the mind and they have no opportunity to explore their inner senses. Of course, the Theosophical Society is a body of wisdom that provides an alternative, but there's also a culture of instant gratification. And so the idea of ayahuasca or DMT or a god molecule is very attractive to that kind of thinking. And it does create radical changes, uh, even when people experience it outside of the Amazon. The real issue that was being talked about is the extent to which the Amazon itself will be changed by the cultivation of the ayahuasca vine in order to feed this global movement. I have a, a friend who's been involved in this kind of spiritual work for about 25 years, uh, American, and he has told me that under that state, you have a sense of oneness with the spirit of the Amazon, the beings of the Amazon, that is completely transformative. But if we lose that, 
you know, what is the basis of the religion, so to speak, of this new movement? So it's a, it's a complicated question. Um, personally, I feel that one of my functions in life is to say, and, and by example, teach that you can have all of these experiences without any of that. But then we also have to deal with the educational system, which has so ingrained people in and so imprisoned them, so to speak, in their mental body, that they don't have any kind of access unless it's completely taken away by a almost induced psychosis that comes from something like uh, ayahuasca. But the elements <coughs> of smell and taste, <coughs> um, there are examples in history that uh, people get um, a huge amount of information simply on, on taste. When I'm in a room, I feel that my taste is changing every every time. And that's, um, as far as I know, um, the shamans, that the real I was scared of, um, they stay for about a full week on exactly the same nutrition in combination with a specific plant in the Amazon just to experience the energy of the plant. And then the next week, they take another basic nutrition form. Again, the same plant to see whatever change comes to. And it makes me wonder, you have um, the three dimensions, which is the feeling, the hearing, and the vision. How about the smell and the taste? Yeah, I think, yeah, I think probably they're connected with what I call energy. Um, they're just different modalities of translating the energy. Um, I'll say just one last word and then we'll break for lunch. Um, so incense is a very powerful transformation, uh, transformer of consciousness. But it's not exactly and only the things that are combined in the smell. It's the state of consciousness that is present in the room. It, there are many studies that talk about how memory is deeply connected with smells. And of course, you can have a smell and it can bring back a particular period in your life with great detail. So think about a temple, for example, where incense is used. And there's a special maker of the incense or keeper of the incense. And only certain kinds of training where certain kinds of ceremonies are done with particular kinds of incense. What happens is the states of consciousness that are targeted by these ceremonies or trainings are invoked by the incense. And the more experience you have with that, the easier it is to go into that state of consciousness. So for me, this comes under the heading of what I call amplification. Okay, I thank you very much for your attention. It was uh, very focused. So hopefully after we eat, we'll still have some chocolate. <laughs>